Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Couchbase. Today, William will be discussing assessing new database capabilities, multi-model. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you'll find those icons in the bottom of the middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send you just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Rick from Couchbase for a brief word from our sponsor. Rick, hello and welcome. Sorry about that, Shannon. I was muted. No worries. <laughs> We're not seeing your screen right now. You stop sharing. All right. Let me get that back on. All right. Good to go? Looks good. All right. So thanks a lot for that introduction, Shannon. I'm going to take this opportunity to quickly tell everyone a little bit about Couchbase, which is a multi-model NoSQL document database. So I'll also be talking a little bit about the Couchbase Analytics Service, um, which helps our clients perform analytics on real-time data. And then I'll talk a little about some use cases and customer successes. All right, so why Couchbase? Well, Couchbase is a little bit different. We're a single platform that includes capabilities and services that support different functional requirements in a single multi-model database, which obviously helps to reduce vendor sprawl. Couchbase is fast, the memory first architecture, elastic scaling, automatic replication and synchronization provides fast performance from the edge all the way to the cloud, even as we scale. We're also flexible, data is stored as JSON documents, and that gives developers the flexibility to dynamically update the data structure as the application needs change. So as the applicant the application grows and the needs um, change, you can update the schema as the data is read into the database, as the data is read from the database, which is much faster and a lot more flexible. Coachbase is also familiar it's designed to make the transition from the relational to the NoSQL world easier. So our customers can move from their relational traditional databases to a NoSQL database, but they can still leverage skills like SQL. And they can also um, duplicate the relational database models within Couchbase. For example, schemers and tables in the relational world are available in Couchbase as scopes and collections. And last but not least, Couchbase is also affordable. Capabilities like multidimensional scaling allow users to configure clusters based on the workload. So you can configure your cluster based on the type of workload you're running, which helps to minimize wastage. So you're not wasting resources, you're utilizing all your resources, which in turn um, allows you to be more effective and more cost effective. All right, so we've got three different options for Couchbase. Uh, the first option I'm gonna talk about is Couchbase Server, which is a self-managed offering and it's available on all the cloud vendors. Um, this gives our options a lot of control so they can maintain control over their data. And it also gives them the custom ability to um, manage their workloads as they wish. And then they can leverage their existing DevOps teams and DBAs because those skills can transition over to Couchbase. And they can also implement their own management strategies and tools. And generally, all customers deploy Couchbase server using Kubernetes. Then we have Couchbase Mobile, which is an offline first data access database, which allows peer-to-peer -peer syncing. So the IoT devices can pair-to-pair -pair sync with each other 
and then sync back up to Couchbase server when they have um, access to the server. We also offer automatic data conflict resolution, which is very important because as you gather data from these edge devices, it can sometimes be difficult to determine which data is the most current. And then we also Couchbase Capella, um, which requires no administration. It's a DBAS offering, and it's very easy to start and start building re uh, remote applications, meaning mobile applications, and also conventional database applications. The setup is fast and easy. Maintenance and upgrades are handled automatically, and that allows for a faster time to market and then the returns on TCO. Basically, you can get performance from less nodes with Couchbase, which helps to drive down your environment costs. So let's talk a little bit about the Couchbase analytics service specifically. Um, this service allows isolation of transactional data from analytical data which helps to speed up the processing on both sides. So you have separate um, nodes for each group of data and therefore each um, processing group is done much more quickly. Each service is able to perform faster. The separation means that the transactional jobs and the analytical jobs can run in separate environments. So again, you can do things like complex analytics, joins, aggregations, et cetera, on a shadow copy of the data that's in your operational environment. And both of these services support SQL querying. So that helps to, to shorten the learning curve because you don't have to learn a proprietary query language like you do with some other platforms. Uh, the data in Couchbase is saved as JSON documents, which means that developers can assign structure when the data is returned from the database so there's no ETL required. You don't have to transform the data as it's being ingested into Couchbase. You can assign a schema as the data is read from the backend database. Also, a lot of our, mem our processing is done in memory. So which means Couchbase is a lot faster. And then all our nodes are equal. We don't have any management nodes. So all nodes are available for work, no node wastages which obviously improves, improves our efficiency and ultimately lowers uh, TCO. All right, so what are some of the requirements for an analytics platform? Well, it needs to be timely. So most organizations, uh, modern organizations are data-driven. Um, they need to be able to analyze data and extract information very quickly. And they need to be able to make decisions on the data that they're generating and then analyzing. So Couchbase helps to solve that problem by making your operational data immediately available, which improves your flexibility. I talked a little bit earlier about the ability to assign a schema when the data is read as opposed to when it's ingested. Again, this helps to improve speed. And then Couchbase is also scalable. So both your analytics service and your data service can scale up as needed. All right, this diagram does a pretty good job of explaining the Couchbase architecture. So as I mentioned earlier, the Analytics data is housed on separate nodes than the data service data, than the data, the actual data from the operational um, operations of the company. So we've got separate data nodes for each set of services. As you can see here in the middle box, you can run your operational apps on the data service and then you run your analytical apps on the analytics service. Users can also join data from disparate data sources. So for example, here on the lower right, you can join data in Azure or in S3 to your Couchbase analytics service and then query that data from the analytics service, which is obviously very important and uh, very 
uh, it's a very good perk to have, right? So you can have data sitting in S3, even say CSV files, you can link that data to your analytical data in Couchbase and then search both those data sets from within the analytics service. And then we also have uh, connectors for BI tools to visualize your data. And we have a native Couchbase uh, Tableau connector, for example, that you can use to visualize your, your data in Couchbase. All right, so let's talk about some customer stories. I'm gonna focus on this e-commerce um, example. Basically what we have here is a need for real-time marketing. Um, lots of organizations want to be able to market in a timely fashion to their customers. So they need to analyze the dynamic data and they need to do it in as close to real time as possible with the goal of creating professional marketing campaigns and then reducing the time it takes to execute their ML models on their analytical data. So in practical terms, Coachbase is able to help our customers reduce the time it takes to create these targeted marketing um, offers. And then we can enhance the ability to gather insight from their customers and determine trends. The whole point is to make it faster for these companies to react to their customer needs. All right, I'm gonna run through these examples because we're running a little bit low on time. Um, one customer that uses Coachbase analytical service is Domino's. And again, they use it for real-time marketing. We're able to help them reduce the time it took to run their ML marketing models. So they have models that they need to run on their operational data in order to determine um, how to market towards their customers. We have that data separated into Coachbase Analytics. They can run their models on the Coachbase Analytics using our user-defined functions and get virtually instant information on their customers and their customer preferences. Another example is that of the Cincinnati Reds. Again, I'm gonna just quickly summarize this. Um, they needed real-time analytics also, and we were able to provide that for them and in, help them to increase their customer retention and also the reporting capabilities within the organization. All right. And here we have a few customers who utilize Couchbase. As you can see, we kind of run the gamut. We've got customers across various sectors. Um, we help them to improve their user experience, as I mentioned before, reduce cost, and then speed up their time to market for their analytical applications. All right, that's about it. Thanks a lot, Shannon. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for kicking us off. And thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring and help to make these webinars happen. If you have questions for Rick and about Couchbase, you may submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake streaming and data integration for products. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Rick, for kicking us off here. It's a pleasure to have a, a strong database that's in the area that um, I'll be talking about today. Here is the sponsor, that being Couchbase. Today, we're going to talk about assessing new database capabilities. I, I guess they're still kind of new. And that is multi-model or multimodal. You'll hear me say probably both things. You'll hear both things said out in the industry. Uh, essentially, it's the same thing. So uh, something to get used to, <laughs> more terminology. Um, so when did this all start, this idea of multi-model? Well, in 2012, the term multi-model database was coined by Luca Garulli. I may be saying that wrong, um, during his keynote presentation at the NoSQL Matters Conference in Cologne, Germany. And the beginnings were traditional SQL database solutions starting to add support for the JSON data type. I remember this as NoSQL became more prominent, widely adopted in the early and mid to 2010s. So 
Uh, I think it's a pretty important topic. Why? Because is it, are we destined that our architectures will forever get more and more complicated and we'll be adding more and more vendors and more and more products to it? It sure seems that way. So whenever I see a little pocket here of, well, maybe we can do some consolidation around that, I, I really uh, look hard at that because our, our architectures are getting pretty complicated out there. And I think I've spent some time in, in past sessions talking about that and all the layers of the architecture. It's so much more than it used to be. So where we see an opportunity for a database to actually handle multiple data types, I think it behooves us to check that out. And by the way, you got to buy or beware here because who's not multimodal out there, multimodal out there? Uh, I went to four conferences uh, last month and uh, mostly put on by database vendors. But either way, there was a lot of database vendors at them. I always seek them out. And of course, I have my usual briefings that I'm taking from database vendors leading up to this presentation. I'm asking them about their multimodal capabilities and oh yeah they have they have all these multimodal capabilities out there right um well i think that uh, some of the models that are part of multimodal uh you have to have certain a certain level of capabilities for it really to be enterprise grade and really for it to make sense within your enterprise for you to even consider it for a true enterprise uh, there are some capabilities that you need within all the aspects of the models that you are going to use in these databases. So buyer beware, be careful. Uh, everybody's multi-model uh, to some degree, but we're gonna to talk today about some criteria that you wanna to apply to the models to make sure that it's good enough for you. Uh, it's a little bit more about me. I've been introduced. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of what we'll be talking about today has to do with uh, coming from the NoSQL marketplace, NoSQL. Now, not all of the formerly known as NoSQL vendors are still embracing the term, some are, but I like the term, so I'm gonna use it. Um, and it has to do with those databases that are not straight up SQL against relational databases, all right? So it's a little bit about McKnight Consulting Group. We offer strategy training and implementation for making data into the asset that it needs to be for your organization. And we've done this for several Global 2000 organizations as well as uh, the mid-market to high degrees uh, of success. So if you have any questions about your architecture technology, your roadmap, your organization, uh, let me know, maybe we can help. And these are some of the clients that we have done this for, a lot of finance, a lot of healthcare, but really we cover all verticals as far as that goes. Now, you're out there making a lot of decisions today. I know you are. Um, and I know it's more complicated than ever uh, to be in this business because there's, there's so many failure points where if you get one layer of the architecture wrong uh, out of 10, you're still bringing the whole thing uh, down or at least uh, limiting the capabilities quite a bit. And it's, like I say, more complicated than it used to be. There's an unprecedented variety of data store choices to meet the needs of varied workloads. There's no one size fits all. That ship has sailed. Maybe it'll come back. Now, I, I see glimmers of hope uh, for more consolidation beyond what we're talking about here today. Uh, that would be nice, but today is not that day. Enterprises have many needs for databases, including cash, operational data warehouse, master data, ERP, and so on, plus plenty of, there's plenty in the operational area, by the way, that we could itemize out here. But we all know databases rule uh, the enterprise. Uh, without them, I don't know where enterprises would be uh, still working with flat files, I guess. While vendor offerings have exploded in recent years in due time, frameworks will integrate components and what amounts to a single offering? Yeah, that's what I was talking about, a single offering. But what if price performance offerings for adjacent workloads in an enterprise have materialized. And I'm here to say that uh, buyer beware, but I believe that some of them have. And let's take a look as we go ahead. No one size fits all once again, um, uh, just to pick on some of the data types we're talking about here, cache, cache database, which we don't all, always think about. It's not a straight up relational database, right? 
It's the smartest database and the trade-offs of expensive, fast in-memory storage and slower storage. As the internet, as an internet example might indicate, its selection is all about access speed. It must have sub-millisecond response, and it must hold its speed as a high number of users pound the database. Now I'm talking about things as if you must do this, you must do that. Always put the lens of your enterprise on it. But I do believe that once you get into one of these areas, you're going to go where a lot of my clients have gone, where a lot of the industry goes in terms of you know, what you need. So multi-model, it's a pretty loose term out there. Uh, so uh, let's uh, try to put some flesh on that. There are many data types, uh, web crawlers, open link data, in, in no particular order here. JSON, yeah, pretty predominant. Like I said, a lot of this multimodal business came because there were JSON databases emerging and relational databases said, hey, we can take that on as a data type and do some things with it. Uh, XML, kind of same thing there. Uh, XML, not as big in favor today as JSON, but still there, of course. Documents, uh, we'll talk more about that as we talk about document stores, binary files being your video, audio, that sort of thing. Uh, graph, uh, I'm huge on graph. We'll talk about that. Log files, log files is, is huge. Log files list actions that have occurred. And web servers maintain these log files listings every request made to the server. With log file analysis tools, it's possible to get a good idea of where visitors are coming from, how often they return, and how they navigate through a site. And hopefully the rest of these are pretty straightforward. Let me mention web crawlers. That might be new to some people. It's an internet bot, which systemically browses the web, typically for the purpose of indexing the web. So like uh, another term for it might be spider. So uh, anyway, these, these are some data types that we're trying to get a handle on within the organization. And we can't just put it in a good old relational database, good old legacy uh, rows and columns database. Uh, why do we need something else? Why did the NoSQL uh, phenomena emerge? And this must have been, if I'm guessing at putting a year on it right here and now, but maybe a dozen years ago or so, when this really emerged and gave us some real options here. So why NoSQL? Why not just straight up relational databases? Well, you get more data model flexibility. We get web services as a data model. There's no schema first requirement. You load the load data first and load what you got. And hopefully you don't make a mess of it and load too many uh, incongruent uh, data types into one. Of course, there's still some design left for you in NoSQL databases. People forget this. You get faster time from data acquisition. Relaxed acid, that's atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability you know, all those things that you need for good transaction processing. Incidentally, some multi-model databases ensure ACID guarantees across all data stores, which is much harder to guarantee in individual databases. So even though I say, yeah, relaxed ACID, that's a good thing, some vendors do it and do it well, and it doesn't really impact uh, performance anymore, but it used to be. It used to be that none of these had assets. Low upfront software and development costs. Of course, that's true for a lot of things beyond NoSQL when it comes to the cloud, programmer freedoms, fault tolerant redundancy, and linear scaling. So there are many ways that NoSQL designs solve problems more efficiently than traditional SQL and relational systems. In many cases, those systems require complex processing that can be avoided by NoSQL systems. The use of document orientation, for example, avoids one of the most complex pitfalls of application, the mapping between objects and relational systems. This is known as the operational relation, op, object relational mapping problem. Okay, why NoSQL? Let's, let's, let's keep on here. These are some of the things that were fundamental to NoSQL, and that's distributed file systems. Of course, this is true for Hadoop. This is true for cloud storage as well. We have multiple nodes and blocks placed across those nodes. Strategically, we won't get into the algorithm too much here today, but uh, the policy is based on a copy written to the node creating the file, written to a data node within the same rack, and a third copy written to a data node in a different rack, usually three. And uh, we can change that, of course. I usually want to leave it at three, 
And the idea being that you are now down to 0 0.00, I don't know how, how far I want to go out here, uh, probability that any that you'll lose any data. And that's obviously very important. Underpinnings of the entire DFS ecosystem, your design goals, you want this scalable to thousands of nodes. Assume failures are common. They're going to be more common with this type of commodity hardware. Target this towards small numbers of very large files and write once, read multiple times. These are highly scalable that to thousands of nodes and massive files. We're talking hundreds of terabytes uh, to petabytes that can now be stored in these NoSQL databases. And they don't use mirroring or RAID. They have other mechanisms, namely the one I just showed you, the triply replicated blocks to deal with a wide variety of failure types. And the secret sauce of the whole thing is that uh, they will <clears throat> quickly restore <clears throat> They are fault tolerance, and they will quickly restore if something goes wrong. So load balancing, fast access, and fault tolerance were underpinnings of the entire NoSQL movement. Now let's get into some of the NoSQL databases and capabilities. And I hope that you are thinking today about these capabilities in context of the database that you're working with. Is it truly multi-model? Does it have these, type of cap these types of capabilities, if they even claim graph? If they don't claim graph and you need graph, and you probably do, uh, that would mean you would probably need a separate graph database, okay? So therefore, there's one less opportunity for great consolidation there. Now, the property graph, there's really only a couple out there. Uh, Neo4j is kind of dominant in this space, but it's uh, it attacks some of the same problems that we're going to see on the next slide when I talk uh, about um, the semantic graph. Now, this is a bit of a property graph model. I've given a whole advanced analytics presentation on graph databases. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, I have high affinity for them, a lot of use for them that I can find in an organization. You can too, whenever there are relationships, whenever they're important, because you can relate nodes by type and direction, and you can have name value properties. So. This is a property graph here. You see there are, why it's a property graph? There are properties on the relationship. So this person named Anne, apparently in the upper right, owns the Volvo. She owns it, that's the property. Uh, the person in the upper left, Dan, drives the, the Volvo. So drive is the property. And then there, are, there can be other attributes assigned, like he's done that since January 10th, 2013. 11, et cetera, et cetera. That's a property graph. And then there's a semantic graph. And they are different in how they attack uh, largely the same problem, although semantic graphs tend to be a little bit more scalable. And uh, obviously, the storage is going to be different. There are more limitations, I would say, on a semantic graph. And there's plenty more vendors of semantic graph. And this has really taken off uh, in the past few years. So Look for your need for this in your multi-model database. Look for your need for this in the enterprise. The data is stored as what's called an RDF triple store, uh, which is uh, three elements working together. It's a semantic databases only work with RDF. Uh, the target market is users of third-party data in RDF. That was the initial target market. And now it really works across all data sets. And Sparkle, S-P-A-R-Q-L, has equivalent functionality to the language that we might use in the property graph like uh, Cypher. And examples of semantic graphs are Lego graph and Eureka, I think. Uh, linked open data is linked data that is open content. We don't need to be concerned too much about that, but if we have graph problems uh, in our organization, uh, we need a graph. We need a graph solution. Don't try to force fit this into your relational database. And I think that's part of my message for today. Don't try to force everything into the relational database unless it's a multi-model database and it can do all these things. So yeah, a lot of I'm leaving a lot of judgment on the table for you because, well, I can't help it. Uh, that's the way it is. This is uh, a complex job. And frankly, I think it's only gonna get more complex for quite a while, the way things are going the mass entry of uh, vendors into the space that we're in, and so on. Exciting times. So databases are multi-model. 
when they can be either, for example, a key value store or a document store. And that's probably kind of the low hanging fruit when it comes to multi-model key value plus document or document plus key value. And I'll get into document and key value, explain what they are. Uh, key value uh, example, my, there's a key and then there's everything else. You have to access everything by the key, the timestamp. For example, in this, in this example, timestamp is the key. Couchbase is a multi-model database, for example, because it supports multiple data models, including key value, document, graph, and search, and others. So uh, a lot of what I find in terms of what drives which platform to use, which data model to use, it depends on the data type. And uh, yes, of course, it does depend on the volume of data that you have for that data type. The more volume might drive more robust solutions. You can get away with uh, less robust solutions if you have lower levels of volumes of the data types that aren't your core data types. But generally speaking, if you have CSV, TSV, or web logs, that's going to be in either a column or a document store. And I'll explain all these as we go along. Documents in a document store, JSON, document store, metadata catalog, column or document, keyed images and documents, key value, and RDF and linked data, as discussed, a graph store. So your data type will drive a lot of the model that you need to use. Again, let's try not to force fit things. You don't have to force fit anymore. Let's start with key, well, let's continue into key value stores. I almost said start with because this is sort of where a lot of uh, the NoSQL uh, marketplace began. This is NoSQL's OLTP equivalent. As a matter of fact, as a side note, I will say that I believe that a lot of these NoSQL databases are taking the reins from relational databases when it comes to operational databases. Operational databases, of course, they're still databases, they're still relational uh, for, the, for the most part, but I do see quite a bit of modern applications using NoSQL databases in place. And maybe that'll be clear as I talk about this a little bit. OLTP is pretty simple. You know, there's not a ton of functionality, it's fast. It's an associative array data model. There's a key and there's a blob pair. I say blob, even though it can be columns, so to speak, but the columns are really not accessed individually. And for many, that's a knockout factor, that's a problem. But if you need high levels of speed, uh, key value is for you. You retrieve value given a key, all access is by the key. The difficulty is that your application cannot run arbitrarily selection, arbitrary selection queries like select splat from table. And so it needs to know where to look for objects in advance. And that can be pretty limiting. But if you're, again, trying to deal with high volumes of data, trying to access it fast, maybe you can uh, deal with that. These are databases like React, Redis, Memcache, Berkeley, Hamster, Dynamo, um, Project Valdemore, open source and Amazon Dynamo DB. Yeah, uh, all the major uh, hyperscalers have uh, products in this space. All right. Key value stores, continuing on here, they are technically horizontally scalable, fast, very fast, resilient to cluster failures, simple, and all nodes are equal. There can be thousands of TPS per CPU core. You can use indexes to look up keys. React, for example, uses Solar. All data stores do a hash of the key to determine the location in the cluster, which obviously that's part of the secret sauce is being able to find the rest of the record based upon the key. It's good for any single object of unstructured data, blobs, speed, wherever speed is important, like in multiplayer games, online games, period, shopping carts. It can handle part of that processing pretty well. Geolocalized processing, where you're trying to take advantage of exactly where a person or a thing is. Uh, it's obviously transitory. Uh, speed when you can't be down. Uh, these are very resilient databases, which is great, and they give you a lot of speed. Key value is often a good choice for serving advertising content to many different web and mobile users simultaneously with low latency. That's probably the main use for it. 
Content of this sort, e.g. images or text, can be stored in key value using unique keys generated either by the application or by the key value store itself. And these can get up to 100,000 writes per second. Wow, pretty fast. Now, a lot of key value stores, or at least uh, the ones that started out as key value stores, are, you know, they've moved into multi-model. And I'll have something to say about that as we go along here. Now it's time to define the multi-model database. Multi-model database, it's a single integrated database that can store, manage, and query data in multiple models, such as relational, document, graph, key value, column store, and cache. It is the opposite approach to polyglot persistence. Does anybody hear that anymore? Polyglot persistence, that was the idea that we should use multiple databases in a workload, each to its own, to its own unique value proposition and stitch it all together, which, yeah, we still do that for sure, uh, but uh, we do wanna limit that. The multi-model idea is not new. It's the same type of database used to support multiple workload categories, albeit on a limited basis. What is new and why I put it in the title is because it, they're really capable today. And make sure that, when, uh, make sure that your selection and your ex, uh, expectation of how a solution will handle one of the models is in line with uh, what the capabilities really are. And that they're not just putting Band-Aids on under the hood. Like for example, I, I know we, we passed it already, but in, when it comes to graph, it's one thing to be able to access data uh, via graph and uh, use graph algorithms on data. And, but if under the scenes it's not stored as a triple store, that's going to perform really slow. And at some level of an enterprise workload, that's not going to work. Document-oriented or databases. Couchbase is a document-oriented database. Uh, yes, they're key value stores. In other words, they have all the, val all the uh, you know, value propositions of key value stores, but they have added capabilities as well like the ability to nest sub-documents. Da the data here is stored as JSON or XML, largely JSON with a tree-like st structure and uh, your ability to group data together more naturally and logically. So key value stores plus different things like the values are queryable. Remember I harped on that as a challenge with key value stores, the values are queryable. Materialized views, yes. Indexes, yes. Documents are addressed by URIs. These support REST interfaces. Good for things like event logging, content management, real-time web serving, and e-commerce. Yeah, it replaces SQL abstract programming where you frequently in SQL, you don't have values for things, but you still have to store a placeholder for it in the relational model. Uh, you, and, and frequently that's going to be a null or an, or an empty column, sometimes a zero, what have you. Uh, we don't have to do that when it comes to document-oriented databases. So the idea is store all data together. Documents are self-describing hierarchical tree structures. Unlike key value stores, the value part of the field can be queried, and that's a big plus. They're good for, I mentioned some things, but here's some more. They're good for a lot of things. They are the general multi-purpose uh, NoSQL database. And so these are, I would say, uh, the dominant uh, model for NoSQL and a great place to launch off into the other models as a vendor of a document-oriented database. So uh, the strongest, uh, the strongest, let me say this right, the strongest multi-model databases come from a document-oriented background. And in case it's not all clear, this is a document example. Baking recipe, the type, mama's cornbread, you see the ingredients, you see it's nested, blah, blah, blah. We won't be making that cornbread today, but you can see what some of the ingredients are for that. If you do make that, let me know how it goes. Couchbase has elastic scalability, always available, global deployment, some of the things that Rick mentioned before. It's a key value store where the value is a JSON document, which makes it a column store. If not JSON, it's a 64-byte string. The JSON is eligible for indexing, 
And uh, there's no extra step of taking the database down to change the schema or anything like that. Um, there is a, I could go into this in detail. I'm going to try to hold back here, but uh, I'm excited about document database. Okay. <laughs> the hash, there's a hash part where they have uh, an even distribution of the data. So the data is distributed based on the hash. There are data buckets and they have this, uh, they have this algorithm that there's so many buckets and it's mapped into uh, a certain number and blah, blah, blah. And it's, a, it's really a beautiful thing uh, how the data gets distributed. So you can have multiple NoSQL solutions working together. This is that polyglot persistence approach. And you would use a key value store for the shopping cart and session data, document or column store for consuming completed orders, a good old relational database for inventory and financials, and a graph store for customer relationship for marketing. Or you could use a good multi-model database. <laughs> and that's uh, part of the point here today. The mission critical store in all of this frequently just does compact come back to relational. Uh, key value pairs are good for fast and simple, document oriented for flexible schemas and modeling, and column stores for time series data. Let's get to that. Column stores are data models, also known as big table, with frequently with column families where you can group different columns together and that data will be stored contiguously. It's kind of like a column database uh, in terms of how uh, that part of it uh, is handled. Uh, MapReduce is used for querying and processing, very light schema, but it's pretty close to a relational database as far as that goes, as far as how you handle uh, it. It's optimized for column-wide operations like count, sums, and averages. So if those are a very important part of your processing, you might consider a column store. We're talking here about Cassandra, a big one there, HBase, uh, and Hypertable, among others. This is good for large amounts of data, data that needs compression, event logging, content management systems. The data model supports semi-structured data. And like I mentioned before, time series data, the data where you want to keep either the last X minutes or the last X generations of the data, and then you don't want it anymore. So stuff like weather data uh, for operations, location data of things, sensor data if you're grading out the readouts, and it's not data that you necessarily want to keep around forever. Although, although I do find that some organizations are flowing the data from column stores into a data lake for more history, I won't say all time history, but for more history so that they can apply artificial intelligence to that data and uh, hopefully improve their operations. Column stores utilize block compression using different compression algorithms like gzip and lzo this is best for this is good for a multi-model launch i would still say that uh, the document stores are good and even better but key value stores may not be the best place to launch off into multi-model there are a few reasons for this key value may not offer the best support for storing and querying complex data structures key value is designed for high performance and low latency so it may not offer the best support for data consistency and transactions. And finally, I'll say key value stores are in-memory data stores. So it may not offer the best support for data persistence. All things you want in your multi-model database. So this, is like, this is an example of a column store. You got a row key, okay, that's kind of there. And then you have what we're showing you here are column families, giving you some definitions here. We've got column keys and column values. Looks like we got a profile, we got some orders going on for this particular instance, can get all related information using a single record ID. Usually they use a random mechanism for the row ID, which gives you faster write, maybe slower read, which is usually what you want in this. Uh, HBase does things a little bit differently. I believe this is a, a Cassandra example. HBase has different properties at the column family level, like the number of versions, the time to live, the compression technique, whether it's in memory or not. Uh, the number of families is known and specified at definition time. So uh, I don't want to say you can't change this, but you do not specify the columns at definition in Cassandra, for example. You can you do that when you are writing the records. And uh, we won't go into it a lot more. Hopefully, I've given you some idea about column stores though. Now, multi-model databases 
that support any of the things that I just showed you should at least support them to the level that I just showed you. And then I'm going to give you some things now to look for in multi-model databases. I got a couple of slides for that. I want to see an excellent implementation of multiple models, not an excellent implementation of one model and a half implementation of the rest, because that can really get you into trouble. You start counting on your multi-model database for, let's just say, key value support, and it's really not there at an enterprise level, that can get you into trouble. You want a single copy of the data. You don't want the data have to be replicated for each model. You want model change propagation. You change it one place, gets changed all places. You want it to work in the microservices world, and you want sub-millisecond response time. So you don't want it to be slow. It's non-trivial to cover the features of an excellent implementation of any model, let alone multiple models. We're talking years potentially of development work to go from one to the other in a good way. While it's understandable if a platform has a first or an anchor model, of course, look carefully at the implementation of the second and subsequent models to ensure compliance with the best practices of those models. These include high compression, node failures without service disruption, a cost-based optimizer, et cetera, things like that. The ability to scale a multi-model solution from one to multiple is crucial since a multi-model database will typically be deployed with one model most prominent uh, at a time. And then you will work your way through other models. At least that's how I've seen it done. Almost all of the models in a multi-model implementation all the ones I'm talking about here have been around a decade or more and consequently have a set of factors that make it work well. Look at those for sure. Here's some more things to look for in multi-model. Globally distributed, multi-region deployments, cross-model data, processing language and optimizer. You shouldn't have to change your language that you're using to interface with the data because you're using a different type of model. You want an edge capable database today because there's a lot of processing we can put at the edge. JSON flattening, yeah, good old JSON flattening without data explosion as a result and universal indices. Wow, yeah, like I said, not easy. Globally distributed applications need a database that can distribute, it, can, can distribute globally and transparently replicate the data anywhere to the center that is closest to its users. That's the globally distributed multi-region deployment. A multi-model database attempts to embrace the challenge of cross-model optimizer by developing a unified query language to accommodate all the supported data models. And I dare say that the optimizer is a big part of the work at moving into multi-model. Every query language needs an optimizer. A good multi-model optimizer will be more difficult to build than a single model optimizer. But data virtualization vendors have overcome essentially the same problem, optimizing queries across databases. So there is hope. Finally, here's some other things to look for when it comes to multi-model. Emerging technologies, the use of artificial intelligence. Look for this too. I wanna to see artificial intelligence in the solution. I wanna know the strategy that the vendor has deployed because uh, I'm buying in. I'm thinking it's very important and uh, very important to our future, to the future capability of the software, et cetera. Integration with data catalog platforms, because they're emerging pretty strong, a robust user experience. Of course, we can take the word robust multiple ways, but um, take a look at the UI for sure in a multi-cloud or multi, or excuse me, a cloud native type of application. Multi-model databases should help companies leverage the effort they are putting into populating their data catalog platforms for data sourcing, rule enforcement, security, and so forth. And as far as that robust interface, should have a modern updated appearance that helps business users easily accomplish necessary tasks. So I hope I've taken you from, uh, at least at this level, through the various models that make up a multi-model database, giving you some criteria to look for in each one, maybe uh, scratch the surface a bit about 
where some of them might be applicable within your organization. Then I gave you some criteria to look for in your multi-model uh, databases. If you are counting on a database for this capabilities, and I encourage you to do so. This brings me to the end of the formal presentation. Feel free to uh, lob some Q&A, Q in, some, some questions in there. And I'm gonna turn it back to Shannon and Rick and I will pick up your questions. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. If you have questions for William or Rick, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen and just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, so for a use case such as a road network to graph, uh, no, as a road network, a graph database would make a good digital twin, how would this work when existing databases for managing the asset on the network are relational? Uh, well, that's a specific use case there. I'll take a first pass at it and, and then bring in Rick on this one. I'm not really familiar with that type of, I think you said a row network. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, and what that means. So I think it's very literally a road network. I believe Warwick you, you works for, uh, yeah. Row, R-O-W? R-O-A-D. Oh, okay, road. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of functionality when it comes to uh, transportation uh, and with graph databases. Um, a lot of the points of, um, a, a lot of the uh, direction setting that happens like with a Google Maps or something, that's all about a graph database where there are various points. They know how long it, go, it takes to go from point to point. When there's a hundred ways to go from point A to point B, it can guide you on the fastest uh, path because of a graph database. It adds up all the point to points that can possibly get you there. And so anytime something is uh, in, in transport, uh, definitely you want uh, strong graph capabilities. I will say though that, since the uh, the questioner threw in the relational component to this, I, I, I'm not sure there's a lot of great multi-model graph plus relational capabilities going on. I'm even scratching my head trying to think of one. So that may be something that uh, we still have to do it with multiple databases, polyglot persistence, uh, and uh, keep an eye on what on the space to to see what develops in that area that that might help you uh, consolidate. Yeah, for my two cents, um, graph databases are generally used as for link analysis. So, as you mentioned, um, William, for trying to find the shortest distance between two points, for example, graph databases are good for that. Um, in terms of the relational world. Uh, I guess you could do something similar in relational databases with your table linkings. Um, but that would tend to mean that you're linking a table back onto itself because you probably have the, the, the location saved in one table. So that might be a little tricky in their relational database world. <clears throat> yeah, it would be self-referencing uh, tables. And, yeah. uh, and that can be uh, problematic uh, from different perspectives. Um, what else was I going to say about that uh, before we move on? Um, well, and he added that we're developing an assessment, uh, asset management data standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, asset management, usually that's pretty, pretty much your rows and columns type of uh, need there. So that would be a relational uh, database. I will add that a lot of relational databases, even the, the the real legacy ones, have added capabilities for graph. Uh, but I think that they are kind of what I said during during my talk, which is okay. They may give you the graph algorithms, uh, but they don't really store the data as a triple store as a as a graph database would. So you will suffer comparatively uh, with performance. And keep in mind that graph databases are, yes, they are about the, the linkages between physical items, but they also can draw out uh, relative importance of various nodes on the network. In this case, maybe various uh, assets that are out there uh, on the road. So uh, I think I think you're, the, they're onto something that you know graph databases are definitely gonna help their application. 
Yeah, um, what I could add to that in terms of asset management, um, that may be a, a, a use case that Coachbase could, could work well in, meaning you could have a document and then all the related documents um, nested within that, that parent doc. And then that would be easier to search back from the database and also it'd be a lot faster. So you could have nested objects within a primary object. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And everyone's super quiet today. I don't have any current additional questions. But, um, you know, Rick, as William was going through his presentation, anything that you want to uh, add that came to mind? Uh, yeah, just from a coach base perspective, I think William did mention this also. Um, there's multiple ways of accessing the data. So um, you can access data in coach base from full text search. You can access it uh from the analytics service from the data service you can do key value lookups you can run sql query lookups so just i just like to uh emphasize the fact that there's multiple ways of accessing your data within our platform well that is all the questions that we have thank you both for such a great webinar and event uh, just a reminder again to all the attendees, I will be sending a follow-up email at end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Really appreciate it, everybody. Thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thanks, William. Thanks, Shannon. Bye-bye.